Welcome to the Calling It Rant. I'm Sly. And I'm, thank fuck, that's over, Spook. Yep. Home and away season has come and gone for Collingwood. Uh, that game... Is that because of the car crash where they almost fell off the cliff? No, they did fall. Um, that game was... Jeez, I want to say it was painful, but it wasn't actually painful. It was a lot of, a lot of fumbling, a lot of errors. It looked like an extremely tired, dispirited bunch who, as we said last week, were just looking forward to uh, the end of the season. So... I don't know that there was really anything to see in that game that was telling, you know, that was informative in any way that we don't already know. We're relying on a lot of kids for the future. There's a few of the older players on the way out. Uh, yeah. Robert Harvey can only do so much with what he has at his disposal and credit to Essendon instead of, you know, as we uh, thought that they might actually just take, Take it easy going into finals. They played like a side where the coach had told them, don't fucking slack off for a second. Keep your mojo happening because we're going to hit the ground running Hit the once the finals come around. I must say I was surprised by that. <clears throat> Normally you get sides in that position where there's nothing that can change the outcome um, in that final game that they go into their shells. Um they didn't. They came out and, and and they were pretty assertive in the way that they played. I was a little bit disappointed. I thought that we might have just gone a little bit more aggressive and made them think about uh, going near the ball and what they've got to come next week. But uh, we didn't seem to take that tact. I think one of the problems is, you know, I mean, again, you get back to the tiredness, the exhaustion. You got a lot of kids in that side too. Who, um, oh, well, that was a good about point. forty-five had, kilos. So of physicality. That's yeah. right. <laughs> I mean, it was McCreary when he came on. Um, he he started launching himself at a few. Um, yeah, but that was about it, really. Yeah, as it stands, I mean, look, thirty-eight point loss. Uh, probably looked like you know Essendon might blast away, so they might have went into cruise mode themselves for a little bit. But there was really nothing that happened in that game where you're sort of sitting there going, "Well, this totally changes my view of the future," or "We should sack quarter," or anything, you know. Unusual. It really was what we expected. And you know what? As he said, thank fuck this season is over. But it did trigger uh, Lee Montagna coming out and saying that um, it, they're all a bit of a rabble. And if you want to go somewhere where there's experience in being a rabble, it be, would be a St Kilda suck. Oh, well, look, I've got to give Lee Montagna credit. I mean, you know, here we are, round 23, finished second last with just six wins. And he's fought. There's evidence here of her rabble. What gave it away, Lee? Was it the 17th position? Was it the six wind? Was it all the losses? Was it the list mismanagement and all that? What exactly gave it away? I think um, I think the theme in this week's episode could involve a little bit of insightfulness oh, and examples thereof. You know, I... And this is why actually I don't mind someone like um, uh, Kane Corns and, and Matthew Lloyd because they actually will go out there and they'll just say something. And Corns is he's good enough to actually, you know, when he, he a couple of years ago he talked about um, Sam Walsh not being worthy of the number one pick, or it should have been at Connor Rosie, but he's come around and said, well, you know, I got that wrong. But I actually like that he'll go and make some pronouncements. They might be stupid, but at least he's not couching it in his fucking neutral crappy way that a lot of them talk like your friend john ralph who told us oh well i thought colin was this management was great last year but now they're second last and they could have had two of the greatest kids in the draft you pointed that out to me on twitter john <laughs> ralph i mean the, the prophecies of ralph adamas so what, what the fuck we, we should have known this last year <laughs> no i think we um we all forgot to look into our crystal balls uh, 12 months ago and realize what was about to happen well, obviously, if we kept the pick and we finished second last, if North bid on Josh Dacos, that means we would have had to use pick two on, sorry, on Nick Dacos. That means we would have had to use pick two on Nick Dacos. So then people would have said, well, maybe they should have traded that pick last year and just accumulated some points. Maybe they should have traded that pick for some mid-range picks so they could draft some young players in and then they could have made up Nick Dacos's bid with just points. It's like everyone fucking knows what they should be doing after the fact. It's all like the Twitter heroes who are also saying, you know, oh, well, we could have had two of the best kids in the draft. Could we? Is it that easy? It's that easy. It's, it's, you had the, um, 
mathematician Ram. He worked it out about what would have happened or what we need in terms of uh, getting Nick Dacos. Uh, and it always ran the risk of, well, look, you know, if we finish wherever we finish and someone puts a bid on him, then our pick goes immediately to Nick Dacos. It only works if we knew we were going to finish last and that way we could use pick one and then any bid we could have matched with points. But we obviously didn't expect to finish last because, I don't know, outside maybe Melbourne, maybe Carlton, the early 2000s, most teams don't ex- go into seasons expecting to finish last. They, they sort of think they're going to probably go a little bit better than that. But you have all these, I don't know, what's the right word from fuckwits? I don't know. Is that right? <laughs> Morons? That's being, a, that's being harsh on fuckwits, though, I think. Um, no, yeah. And, and John fuck- Ralph, for fuck's sake, you're meant to be a journalist. Sorry, I cut you off. For fuck's sake, John Ralph. Jeez. Your, your, your cousin fucking Ralph now would be totally appalled by your idiocy. Go on. Sorry, I cut you off. Oh, I can't remember what I was going to say now. Uh, um, you, you've upset me. Why don't why is, you think Ralph Mouth shouldn't be insulted? <laughs> yeah, no, I mean, there's some amazing revisionism going on on, on Twitter, but geez, there's a, it comes as a shock in itself. I mean, it, it really comes down to the fact that, hey, all right, let's say we kept that pick. There was still no guarantee we could have taken two kids, you know, or Nick Dacos and someone else. Because again, if North uses pick one to bid on Nick Dacos, then whatever we had would have had to go to Nick Dacos. So that's it. That's where all it comes down to. So, you know, and whether North does or doesn't bid on him now, it could just simply be that, you know, they all say, well, Collingwood doesn't have that pick to match, so we won't even bother bidding on it. They're going to have to fucking pay him points anyway. But, yeah, I, I just... Well, it's it. I mean, it, it, it's, it's almost now coming down to um, if North don't bid on him, and if, I don't know how tactically that does improve... Things other than the fact that you take away that sort of perception that you've, well, there's two things, I suppose. You're taking away that, that, that sense of pressure on a, on a number one bid when they, because that bid then slides down. From my understanding, if, if, if they bid and we have to match the bid, then doesn't Nick Dacos then become the number one pick? And the North's bid is essentially recognised as number two. I think that's my understanding. I could be wrong. I've been wrong about three things before. Um, the second one is also if you have the number one pick and you then nominate that um, on someone else and then you say, okay, well, I'll take this guy now, in that guy's mind, it's almost, almost devalues him to that extent. Do you want to do that to a uh, someone? Do you right? Wouldn't you rather celebrate them being a first-round pick? You think so, I don't know. I mean, I there's, there's pros and cons both ways, I guess. But uh, yeah, so if that's the case and North don't bid and then GWS, I can't see them taking our bid and then bidding on him. I mean, Surely we'd have some sort of fucking back scratching deal going on there. But, so that means like from pick three onwards, we're, we're sweet. We've got enough points. We don't have to go into deficit. Um, let the cards fall where they may. Well, as it is, I mean, you listen to the speculation, you know, right now, it's like, well, okay. Well, how about it's, we just park it? In 12 months' time, I'll come back and tell you whether I was right or wrong. Well, I was just going to say, I mean, you listen to sort of all the provisions. It's like, well, if this falls this way and that fell that, fell that way, how the fuck could any club, let alone Collingwood, how, could, how the fuck could any club predict any of this and still get to this point and still like actually say, well, now if North don't bid, then okay, we can get him a bit lower or whatever. No one can factor in that many calculations as to what they should be doing. So they did what they thought was That's best. Yeah, Pretty Twitter. Good. Well, Twitter's the, you know, the main of everyone's a genius in fucking hindsight. I mean, it just really is frustrating. It's like, it is what it is. It's fucking done now. Okay. So just enjoy it. You're going to fucking have Nick Dacos and leave it at that. Yep. Um, the coaching merry-go-round. So Gary Lyon, not Gary Lyon. So Ross Lyon. Ross Lyon. Lyon. Ross Lying? Yeah, Ross Lying. He came out on footy classified and he said a bunch of shit about, oh, well, you know, I, I, Graham, Wright, Graham Wright reached out to me. He asked a friend for my phone number because this is the way fucking big jobs work. You know, the, you ask for phone numbers from mutual third parties. And isn't it just the way? You wouldn't go like to their manager or anything like that. You just ask their mate. Hey, oh, um, can you um, just quietly give me uh, Ross Lying's phone number, please, uh, mate? Could you, if you don't mind? Thanks. Well, Ross, I mean... And I then want... what happened? How did Ross Lying reply? Did he give Wrighty a ring? I imagine he was straight on the blower to him. Well, I 
I've always said I like Ross Lyon, but fuck, this really pissed me off. It's like, well, I bumped into Lee Matthews and, you know, he really made me think twice about, oh, yeah, maybe I can coach again. How the fuck did you bump into him? We're in lockdown. <laughs> Fucking hell. He bumped into him on Zoom, I think, accidentally. <laughs> Lee, what are you doing logged in? And then, you know, um, he talks about... But oh, no, he said, he said they went for a coffee. Yeah. Is that what he said? Was, no, was it specifically coffee? Well, isn't Eddie McGuire the marshal of the coffee appointment meeting? I don't know. But anyway, Ross Lyon said, well, the chemistry wasn't right. I don't know how you determine that without going to the club for an interview. <laughs> Apparently, you just judge that from afar now. Like, is Yuri Geller or someone? John Edwards? Maybe he's just talking maybe, to the fucking dead. Maybe he's just a fan of Mondo Rock. <laughs> and there was a misalignment. just want to get that out. In the middle of a conversation, just want to let you know. And the misalignment. So, who's she? Well, you know, not, not being aligned with the cookbook. I don't know. I, ah. I, I don't know. I don't know. And, and then the inst- political. Was it, was it misalignment or was it misalignment? <laughs> well, Ross, like. the, the political instability. Um, because he's talking to Carlton, he's fielding that. Their, their political well, landscape. They're a rock of stability. I can understand <laughs> where brilliant. he's coming from. There. You know, How many coaches they had in the last 20 years? About six, seven? Oh, well, here's a club that you know had a favourite son in Brett Radden who was doing a good job with them. But then when Nick Malthouse came on the market, they knifed Radden, they brought Malthouse in and they chopped him. Um, they sold the farm to get Chris Judd there, which really, look... Judd was a fucking champion, but West Coast won that deal hands down because Kennedy is a premiership player. So that's what you play for. Uh, and then they went and paid, well, I don't know, what, about 750 grand for, for Grand Facade and Williams. And now they're going to knife poor David Teague to get Ross Lyon in there. So this is a fucking stellar club. This is, you know, club that's just full of integrity and nobility and, and they're just pristine in their management. But hey... That's where I'd be going. Maybe we should, uh, when we should start supporting them, they sound like they're a club with uh, promise. I, I, I really like where Carlton's been the last 20 years. Um, I long may it last. I mean, it does worry me that I do think they have a good core group. So maybe if they got a good coach in there, who knows? But, or maybe, you know, if they get a good run with injuries, sorry, because I mean, Teague's actually had some horrific injuries. Uh, sounds like us, actually. And then you get people like Tom Clown on Twitter saying, I can't remember the last thing, I'm not going to really justify it outside of the a rough recap, which he said, oh, the Collingwood position to come down to four people and Michael Voss had, uh, had a bad interview and blah, blah. And then a couple of days later, the Herald Sun said, oh, it's come down to Don Pike and, and, and Craig McRae. And then about two days later, SEN said, well, Jamie Graham's interviewed um, and he, he had a great interview. He just blew him away. And it's like, okay, but according to Tom Clown and the Herald Sun, Graham wasn't mentioned there. So when did Graham interview? Did he interview after it come down to the final two? Is that the way Collingwood's doing it? Just interviewing and drawing up shortlists and going outside those shortlists to interview more fucking people? Oh, then, I have it on good authority. They don't have a plan. Well, for the first time, ever in my time following them and you know it's actually the first time ever in their history they've actually run an exhaustive coaching uh fucking process to find the best person available and then you still get idiots going well if they don't get clarks and then they failed (laughs) we're still going back there (laughs) there's no chance that Clarkson can actually say no it's just a point of failure for us we should have worked harder we should have enticed him harder I think you should have um, um, nailed him to a, to to a, to a to a number of planks and then just attached electrodes to his nipples or something until he said yes. I mean, you, you don't want a coach who actually wants to be there. You just give them well. A, that's another point. You just you just give him a godfather off and just say do the job, and then they're there half hearted and not really hearts not really in it and all that. And that's not a recipe for disaster, is it? No, not a Collingwood. It's the, the 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 madness, the fucking narrative, the, the shit that people are spilling now. It's absolutely insane. It really just frustrates the shit out of me because it's like, you know, I've criticised or we've criticised the club as much as anyone, but you know what? We can actually stand back at times and go, well, hey, how are you criticising for this? How are you criticising them for the fucking the, the draft pick being swapped last year now but they should have had the foreknowledge to know well this draft pick is going to be a low pick I mean was Corder responsible for the loss on on 
fucking Sunday was was his usual I'm response. Reliable, I'm reliably informed by Peter, people smarter than me um, that that's the case. Where do you take this club? Club still, you know, people are going. Well, hey, you got to spill the entire board. It's actually you don't because they're fucking technically elected and ratified. In the process no, that you supported the last We haven't, we haven't elected years. a board member in, in 23 years. I don't know how many we elected prior to that, but um, maybe it should be longer than that. But no, we haven't elected anybody. Well, I guess so all those, all those AGM meetings where um, people put up their hands, were asked to ratify something, um, that's not real. It didn't happen. Well, you know what? I mean, what's Jeff? I worked out what Jeff Brown's doing. It finally occurred to me today that he's not saying anything because every time we attack him for not saying anything, someone fucking responds to us in the comments or on Twitter or on whatever, on message boards. Oh, he's about this. No, he's not. He hasn't said anything. You're making that up. You're inferring that from him criticizing the board, which is fine. He can do what the fuck he wants, but he hasn't actually had a platform. He said nothing. So no one don't fucking comment in the comments. Don't, Hit us up on social media saying this is what he's about. He hasn't said anything. I um I have a bit of an exclusive for the rant. Um, I've heard that there's a third campaigner coming in to the to the presidency run. He's a, a famous wearer of black and white um, over the over the journey. Um, he's a very similar commentator to Jeff Brown. I, it would be great to get the two of them in a room together and debate uh, the way forward. And that's Marcel Marcel. Um, <laughs> Marcel Marcel. He's uh, very, very vocal about his thoughts on the pies. And um, I think he's ready to take on Jeff Brown head to head. It could be well, a shouting match. Well, that would be great. I mean, look, you know, if that's the way Jeff Brown wants to play. It, it's fine. I have no problems with that. My problem is don't tell me what he's standing for because he hasn't actually said anything. He has not said anything since he made that. Fight him on that? Oh, yeah. He hasn't said anything since he made that outrageous claim that he invented the question mark. <laughs> and, you know, and, and I'll say this too. I mean, the incumbent board should be saying, I think, a bit more. I mean, quarter should be coming out. I've said it to you before. Quarter needs an image. I'm getting right behind quarter now just to piss people off. Quarter needs an image revamp. Get rid of these fucking suits that just disassociate himself from the, the rank and file. As I've told you before, Getting get him in some wrestling trunks, throw a world title over his shoulder, just have him walking around like that. He can just be one of the fucking guys. He'll connect with a lot more people and maybe he'll body slam any contenders or any opposition. Maybe maybe some wrestling trunks with uh, Jeff Brown's face on the ass cheeks. Would that be would that be taunting enough? I would love to just see them start cutting wrestling promos on each other. You know, and and at some point, you know, we still get people pushing you EGN and all that sort of shit even though there's no petition now. But anyway, um, you still get people pushing it, fine. But it's like, well, at some point, you need your, uh, I don't know, what do you call Brown? Their champion, their patron? I don't know. What the fuck you call him? I don't know. Um, but he is going to have to start making some noise. He's going to have to start announcing people on his ticket. That's a funny statement in itself. It is. It's, you know, I... I I've actually, I, and I think a lot of people are just going sick of this shit. It's like, look, go to AGM, spill the positions that are vacant. Um, I don't think the clubs, as it stands right now, I mean, it sounds like they're getting the coach in place. Obviously, the board needs change. You know, we've never said, hey, quarter should be the president in, you know, forever. They probably do need someone else. Um, I've always said it should be Murphy. You know, that's sort of always felt. But all this outside fucking noise now it's just it's it's seriously it's gone from constructive to just whining bitching repetitive pure old shit it's it, i have not seen one constructive thing said in relation to this egm and of course no one's fucking no no not a single person has actually posed Here's some solutions that we feel the club should incorporate outside of David Hatley, who originally when he spoke to the quarter and then he spoke to Lucuria Murphy, he said, well, these are things that I think you need to address. He's the only person, the only single person out of anyone who's ever put down some ideas for the club to address. No one else has done it. For everyone else, it's like, let's just fucking spill the board and then bang, we're done. Let's just walk away. Have to spill the board because the unknown quantity in there couldn't be any worse than what we have. 
Is that the is that the thought? Oh well, when's you know when's a new group ever done worse? That's never happened, has it? No. Maybe she yeah, says no. Nah, it's uh, wasn't it? Uh, there's something about it's uh, going to the Supreme Court for the forty eighth time or something this Friday. Oh, didn't the Supreme Court throw it out and say? Did, 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 oh, if I was like a Supreme Court judge, I'd just be saying, "You're a fucking football club. Go fucking sort this out." Oh, I heard the judge just looked at the proposal and said, "I can't make a word. I can't make any sense of these words." What, what what's this? What's a grib nib? <laughs> I can't make sense of your petition wording. <laughs> and you get any guy on fucking footy classified like Al Capone in prison still trying to run the place. You know that that Ross Lyon pronouncement. You know where Ross Lyon said, "If you are still president, Eddie." <laughs> <laughs> You know how many people I had contact me and said, geez, I wonder who put him up to saying that. I saw some um, strings above Ross's mouth um, and arms. It was like watching an old episode of the Thunderbirds. That used to be on Channel 9 as well. Show. Um, yeah, I mean, it's amazing how, like, you couldn't even see Eddie's lips move. He was, like, the, probably the, the most effective ventriloquist I've ever seen. Oh, you know, I actually like that... Um, sorry, going back to Ross' line... A few people have called him out. Uh, Heath Shaw, club, you know, Collingwood Premiership player, uh, great name at Collingwood. He said, my sources say that he was sitting by the phone and the phone never rang. So, Ross, I'm calling you a little bluff there. I think you're telling little porcupines. I don't think you got a call from Collingwood. I don't think Collingwood wanted you as the coach and they didn't want to interview you. I mean, from what I've heard, and other people are saying it too, he was never in their, cal- in their calculations. So... This was quite a surprise. and yeah, That's true. I, I, I got hold of um, uh, Ross Lying's uh, Spotify playlist um, the other day and it was 148 repeats of Hanging on the Telephone by Blondie. <laughs> um, Amazing. Yeah. it's. I actually, once you get to the AGM, just fucking settle the board shit and then just move forward. Um, it's If you believe the interwebs, Craig McRae will be our new coach. Mm-hmm. I'm actually looking forward to that. I had a conversation with a friend just going, oh, well, you know, I think we need an experienced coach because it's in these formative years, you don't want someone who's learning on the job. And I was going, well, yeah, that's fine. But um, as far as Clarkson goes, if he doesn't want to do it, he doesn't want to do it. You can't force him. That's it. You know, Apparently you can, though. Well, he was going, oh, well, he was going to coach at Hawthorne next year. And I was going, well, yeah, he was going to coach at the same place. He was going to fucking uproot, go elsewhere, start all over from scratch. Uh, it's quite different. As for, and then he said, well, you know, you look at what Buckley did when he took over the club. And it's like, well, Buckley had two years as an assistant under the, the guy he played for, under for, what was it, eight, nine years? Um, one year out of the game, and that was it. That was pretty much his entire CV in terms of an apprenticeship. Where he has, McRae has been a developmental coach at, uh, at Collingwood, sorry, um, years ago. He... Mm-hmm was an assistant at Richmond. He was a VFL coach at Richmond. He coached him to a runners-up and he also coached him up to a, fl- to a flag. And he was also an assistant to um, Clarkson this year at Hawthorne. Yep. So this guy's got, you know, he's got a lot more qualifications than Buckley has as a coaching prospect. He's coached his own clubs. He's, you know, I know they're at VFL level, but still he's had that experience. He's developed players. We've got a young list and he's, he's coached and played under various different coaches. I mean, Buckley as a player, he really just played under, I think it was Robert Walls for one year in the, in the AFL I'm talking about. Walls mm-hmm. and then Tony Shaw and then Lee, oh, sorry, and then, um, sorry, he played under Walls, Lee Matthews for two years, Tony Shaw and then Malthouse for the bulk of his career. Whereas yep. McRae's been around quite a bit. He would have had about 28 coaches at Brisbane in the first five years, wouldn't he? And, you know, he's coached in different roles. So he might not work, but geez, you look at him, you think, well, you know what? He's armed himself with all the tools you'd think you'd want of a prospective coach. I mean, I think it's it's got to be a combination of um, um, the desired skill set. They hopefully think it's there and um, coming from a successful environment. I'm, yeah. I'm, I'd be reasonably more than happy 
if that's the case. Look, I mean, obviously, I'd take Clarkson at the drop of a hat as well. Um, but I see a lot of benefits out of the McRae appointment if that's who it ends up being. Um, it's he's obviously fairly short in the betting thing these days. I think uh, someone said to us early tonight that betting's been suspended on the um, on the on the coach. Uh, betting front, so isn't that that'd be conclusive enough, wouldn't it? Whoever uh, was running the shortest should be uh, should be it. Well, I think the interesting thing too is if you look at like um, but again, yeah, this is going by scuttlebutt. But if you look at who it came down to, which is Pike, Pike said he doesn't want to leave Sydney. Um, oh, that board's failed again. <laughs> McRae, Voss was thrown up there, and Clarkson obviously, and the sort of. A little bit of an outsider was that Jamie Graham. But if you look at all those people, they were, and talking about, you know, whether they had coach like Voss and Pike or whether they were coming up, they all had pretty extensive and diverse experience. So it looked like the club sort of said, well, look, we're not going to go for an untried coach in this situation. We want someone who has done quite a bit. And if you look at like um, two of the newer coaches, I reckon John sorry, not John, David Noble did a really good job with North Melbourne given what he was, you know, handed. And that young side, not competitive for most of the year. Most teams that finish 18th are just getting smashed week after week after week after week. After about the first four or five weeks when they were getting smashed, they were relatively competitive. And then you get Pagan, uh, Fagan, sorry, at Brisbane. I can, yeah. yeah. <laughs> they got to change their names. But anyway, um, and I remember Lee Matthew said this, he's going, I think, you know, Coaches from now on will be guys with 10 years experience who've done as many roles as possible. So when they go into it, they're versatile and they're adaptable and they've got a lot of experience. And I think if you look at the people Collingwood has been interviewing, that's the people who've made their shortlist. It's not, you know, someone who retired two years ago and is, you know, a really hot prospect. It's people who have actually done the hard yards to, to earn that chance as a senior coach. I don't think, as you pointed out, too, most of the premiership coaches the last 20 years have been um, yep. non-experienced ones. Yep. Guys at their first job. Um, our captain, Scott Pendlebury, radio interview. He came out and um, he said he wanted to remain a one-club player, but he added, uh, if clubs are not offer- offering coaching gigs, quote, for a couple of years' time, I'll have a look at it, end quote. Um, he said previously that he wants to get into coaching. He doesn't want to do the Buckley route where he's pretty much just, you know, retires as a player and he's straight into it. He, but, you know, it's a sort of really bizarre message to be saying when you're still at the fucking club. Yeah. Um, and I see he's getting, uh, he's getting lambasted a fair bit as well. Um, he said a few stupid things in his time. I mean, I recall a few years ago when Richmond smashed us, he said, oh yeah, we gave up. It's like, why are you telling us that? <laughs> He didn't say exactly what he gave up, but he sort of said, oh, it was, yeah, pretty much, you know, it was like, you know, we didn't have anything to play for. So we, and anyway, I mean, it's pretty, it pretty much came down to we gave up, we gave up. So anyway, go on, sorry. Interrupt yeah, I wonder if that's also a little bit of a, an orchestrated move. I don't think he's doing it to, to put leverage back on the club to increase his contract or anything. I would think he's been fairly well remunerated over the journey. Um he's probably going to do well again out of that one year contract, but maybe if it's an amicable parting that, you know, if, if the club can get something of value back for him, um, he gets what he wants. Isn't that a, a bit of a win-win both ways? Oh, you know, I mean, he's, he's been a club champion. I don't think he's going to do anything more um, than he's already done um, next year. Um He's got nothing left to prove. Maybe it can be a little bit about what what he wants moving forward, and that could benefit the club as well. Maybe there's been discussions um, away from that to to say that we won't stop you, um, and maybe it's a win win for both of us. Who knows? Yeah, uh, so you you would accept <clears throat> losing him to another club? Oh yeah, well he's only got really probably another year left in him. Oh, he's probably looking. At he's got two years on the halfback flank. I mean, I don't, who knows what his body's like. The last couple of years, he's really seems to have slowed down, and he's had a few injuries. Um, like I recall last year, where he had the hamstring or whatever it was during the warm up against West Coast. I mean, he's so getting at an age where he's going to have niggles and shit. Uh, but like I've seen people say, "Oh, well, if Collingwood, you know, if Collingwood let Scott Pendlebury walk away, then this is what's fucking wrong with the club." It's just 
quarter, damn you quarter. Well, that's an easy one, really, isn't it? What, what would you would you be upset if he left? No, no, I, I don't want him to leave. Um, but given the situation the club's in with the salary cap, the list management, all that sort of shit, you <laughs> if Collingwood would say, "Look, he is, we're not going to pay you that much next year. You know, we've, we've given you twenty eight million dollars over the last nine years, or whatever it is. Um, we're only going to afford to pay you like four hundred grand next year, and if." whether Brisbane or someone comes along and goes, look, we'll give you 600 grand. And you could possibly play in the flag. I'm not going to begrudge him leaving. No, I don't, I prefer he didn't. I prefer he was a one club player. But if that sort of situation came along and he said, well, you know what? I want to have one more shot at it. And I think I'm going to have a couple of years at this club and they're going to pay me more. I definitely would just say, well, not just to him, to fucking anyone, we'll go. You know? Yeah, I mean, probably the only um, negative that I would see would be the clear standout is, is that we already have an issue with um, distribution of age at the club. We can't discard too many yeah. mature players. Um, however, though, if the right sort of thing come up, um, the benefits both, I wouldn't be too upset. Yeah, it's funny that I saw people criticising this, but these are the same people who were raving and lauding Hawthorne when they offloaded Mitchell and Hodge and, and Lewis. It was fine then when Hawthorne did it. It was genius. But when it comes to Collingwood, it's like, ah, well, this is what's fucking wrong with this club. All right, well, I'll tell you what. I'll, um, I'll, I'll have an opinion on it. I won't say anything about it now, but I'll tell you what I was thinking 12 months from now. <laughs> Would it be the right thing? Were you thinking like, you know... I can guarantee I, I won't have gotten the uh, the commentary wrong. It's actually interesting too. You look at like someone Penderbury does want to coach and he's potentially looking at something that, you know, Hodge did where he's an on-field coach effectively. Um, so I remember Mick Maltese used to say a lot that, you know, if you're thinking of retiring, then, you, then you're gone, go. Yeah. And, you've already had, yeah. Yeah. And while Penderbury is not openly thinking about retiring, he's, he's, he is thinking about, what comes next and he's preparing himself for that. So that is a little bit of a concession about, well, I'm near the end. So, you know, maybe he actually needs to think about where we should be playing at all, where we should maybe just go somewhere and get, go straight into an assistance role somewhere. Yep. I mean, and that could well happen too. Yep. He's contracted though, isn't he? Oh no, no, he's not. No, no he's, not. he's out now. That's Sorry. Yeah. So yeah, there's nothing stopping him really, is there? Nope. Uh, out of curiosity, just going to throw this out there. Should Collingwood have challenged Bodie Mycheck's suspension? Well, I think so. There you go. At least be seen to be doing it. I mean, really, what's going to happen? They're just going to have a hold the decision against the week anyway. I think that's one area that we've been a, limp, a bit limp with over the last couple of years. There's, there's things that we should have challenged that we haven't. That'd yeah. be Quarter's yeah. fault, though, wouldn't it? Oh, he was president for the last nine years. Yeah, but he, but he makes the decision about whether we um, go to the tribunal, doesn't he? Yeah. Oh, look, I, I think my check was guilty as soon under, under the interpretations they have for the head high contact. Totally guilty. People were comparing it to the Joel Selwood one. And it's like, all right, Selwood's also guilty. They should have picked that up. Yep. Selwood getting off doesn't make my check innocent. But I agree with you. At, at times, I don't actually care what the outcome is. I think you just need to be seen to be doing something because it really unifies the club and it lets the supporters know, that, well, you know, this club's not going to take shit. They're standing up for what they believe is right and we can back them for that. Um, yep. A few other times, I think they should have done that in the past under Eddie Maguire's rule. I won't mention any of them, but one was when that Mark Robinson drug story broke, but we did very little then. Anyway, but yes, I think they should have also. All Australian squad is named, not a single Collingwood player. You shocked? Well, I was I actually thought Chris would have at least gotten a nod. Um, so it, it's just the forty at this stage. I I would have thought he would have had his name up there. Yeah, totally agree. Um, nobody else, I think, uh, was worthy. I am loving though the comments that um, because apparently is one of the highest paid. Um, Grundy's one of the highest paid players now that he should just mandatorily be there on the list. Um, and it's now distraught and and upsetting that he's not in terms of uh, you know his performance. That's a that's a great that's a great comment. Ah, well, you, you know, the Australian side is based on salary, isn't it? it, isn't it? I did. Clearly, it is. Out of curiosity, would you trade Grundy if you could? Yep. And what would you expect back for him? Uh, Fourteen first round picks. I mean, if you traded a couple of years ago, then it would have been like, hey, you could you could have 
come on four first round picks, but um, he's yeah, look, I contract think, and his former last two years. Well, the, the problem still exists there. That you, you look if you got one first rounder back, you'd be over the moon. But no matter what, you're going to be paying part of his salary for for the next six seven years. Um, I'm I'm happy though to to see what a new coach can and a new um, group of assistant coaches can do with him. I mean, he was you know. He was all Australian for a reason a couple of years ago. Um, if he can get that back, and we can get some synergy working with the with the mids, he could be a force again. How old is he? Twenty uh, seven. Um, I mean, I think the other problem too, if any trades they could potentially do, they just immediately get consumed by the Nick Dacos points, don't they? I'm not sure. So, all right. So, slightly. Well, yeah, yeah. So, slightly pathetically, we whatever trade to Carlton. Carlton gives us pick eighth, whatever, for Grundy. But that then goes to Nick Dacos, doesn't it? Yeah, I think you're right. So, yeah, those. But I don't know. Actually, can you just can't you use whatever point tally you have and just move that, or do you have to use the first rounder? To match. I don't know. It's, if a good, it's a good question. Yeah, I don't know. I mean, I think if he's bid on, then they have to go to the whatever they've got. Um, yeah. Which is why, like, Bulldogs just offloaded. Okay, yeah, and, round. yeah. And which is what Collingwood's logic was last year, too. It was let's just let's do this with points because if we have an early pick, it's just going to go straight to him. Let's get a couple of players in and then we'll just get Nick Dacos with points, even though our first pick won't be until pick 30 or 40, whatever the fuck it is. Um, so I'm actually, I think that's going to hamstring a bit in trading unless they went and traded for players. I mean, one of the scenarios it suggests is the clubs that need um, Ruckman like Geelong and GWS. I mean, they've still got Mumford there and he's about 90. <laughs> and I know they've got other tools there, but I mean, they're still using Mumford and he's about 90. Um any so, Milton blokes with his number frame? Well, someone like Mumford, for example, or, or sorry, someone like GWS, you, you'd trade Grundy and you'd say, okay, throw in Riccardi and then some other stuff. So you actually address some needs. And the only reason yeah, I throw Grundy in there is... Palatable. Yep. Yeah, the only reason I throw Grundy in there is um, I think he'd get some good value out of the exchange. He'd get to play for hopefully a side that's in premiership contention. But also in terms of the rebuild, I think the ruck is the last position you can address. So if you lost him now, you know, you could bring up Max Lynch and hopefully he works out or you'd find someone yeah. else later. Because if you look at the premiership, you know, Richmond, Nankervis is a ruck in there, in all three of their game, uh, sorry, premierships, I think. And he's a good solid ruckman, but, you know, he's not really spectacular. If you look at West Coast when they beat us, Lysette was their ruckman and Vardy. Again, they're good, solid Ruckman, but they're not superstars. So I, don't, I think to win a premiership, you don't need a superstar Ruckman, but it's great to have a superstar forward or great to have a superstar mid. They seem to be a lot more valuable. Anyway, that's just my opinion. What the fuck yep. do I know? Uh, yeah. Uh, kudos to the, the club, too, since we're, you know, praising them. Uh, throw on the one highlight from the Essendon Collingwood game, and I see it's Maynard to Cameron. Brilliant. And I watched the clip, and it's actually Jack Crisp running out of the centre <laughs> to centre yeah. half forward, and then kicking long to Cameron. It's like, how the fuck do you get that wrong? Figure the pulse. <laughs> that digital guy's never gotten anything wrong, has he? Big thank you to Chris Main who announced his retirement. Well, announced his retirement two weeks ago, but played his final game. Um, you should stop criticising him, Spook, because we get our peeps angry. Oh, okay. I promise I won't bag him next year. Yeah, good on you. I uh, noticed that he played in a very spiffy Miami Vice-like ponytail this game. What was all that about? I don't know. He, he seriously needed like the pastel blazer and the, the big pants like, you know, to have Don Johnson and um, Philip Michael Thomas there. Could have been a really good Miami Vice scene. I, I don't know. He should have rocked up to the game in a DeLorean. <laughs> uh, but thanks to, you know, Maine, he's put his body on the line. It's talk that allegedly Jared Ruffhead will leave because he was unhappy about the treatment handed out to Trelaw and Phillips and Stevenson. I think it took him all year to come to that conclusion. Oh, I think he's probably had that conclusion the whole year. John, was John Ralph advising him? I don't know who was advising him. It was, I don't know. So, someone will tell us next year. I told you 12 months ago it was a bad decision to stay. Yeah. 
But it's amazing the sort of stuff that goes around the the rumors. I mean, I keep hearing people kept telling me Maine's leaving. Maine is leaving. Le- yeah, Maine is leaving. Yeah, well, they're right. <laughs> they're telling you Maine's leaving. <laughs> well done. 10 out of 10. Um, yeah, I did hear again um, Watley this morning on the um, SEN talking about uh, the possibility of Maynard leaving. Yeah, I, I actually um, believe, and I, I just want to break this, this is an exclusive, Jaden Stevenson's leaving the pies. Is he? Yeah. Was it something we said? No, probably. No. Well, that's disappointing. Uh, when said it four months ago. You have a premiership tip? <laughs> Do I give a fuck? Yeah, that would have been my tip. <laughs> um, oh, geez, it's it's certainly open. Um, I really don't want to see Melbourne win. I, I could go the opposite direction, easier, I think. I don't want to see uh, Melbourne win. I don't want to see Geelong win. And I don't want to see uh, Brisbane. maybe Port. Yeah, well, I'll actually, yeah, Brisbane as well. Yes, I've seen you on win. No, look, I, if I had a, if, I, if there was a team I wouldn't mind seeing do it again, it'd be the Bulldogs. Yeah, I think they're gone. <laughs> yeah, but yeah, exactly that. It, um, but really, I don't think there's anyone out outside of the four that can win it, and anyone inside of the four can win it. It's such a fucking flat season. Um, yeah, I don't know. No, I, think Geelong, I think Geelong's the team to beat. I think. Although. Yeah, I mean, one roughy would be GWS as well. When they're on, they're really on. Yeah, but the, the problem too. Can they do that four weeks in a row though? No, well that's the issue. Yeah, I, I, I'll then just tip you along just because I think they have a bit of experience and hardness, and now it's the finals. It goes up another level, I, and I actually think that loss on the against Melbourne is going to help them because it's going to be that sort of loss where they're going to say, "Fuck, we're not, we're not letting that happen again." It's like when they lost the. Hawthorne in the 208 grand final, then they beat Hawthorne about the next 64 times they played and they just refused to lose. So I actually think that's going to be a big motivator for them. But I, I, I'm I'm pretty different. I actually don't care who wins it from this point. There's no team in there who I dislike, like a Carlton or S- oh, sorry, Essendon's in there, but I don't expect them to last for four weeks. If they well, do, I'll look like an idiot. I love Melbourne, but <laughs> to be honest, I, I, I just see them imploding at some point. So that would be funny. I mean, the, the one key thing I want to see out of the finals this week is Essendon lose. I want yeah. to see that streak go on. <laughs> well, if, if, look, actually, if Melbourne win good on them, fuck, uh, I don't care. It's one of these things, like, I always sort of look at the finals and think, all right, if Melbourne wins, then, you know, Colin would just look at your fucking cells and go, well, Melbourne's now winning grand finals. What are you doing? You know, get your shit together. Yeah, well, it's a point, isn't it? So I probably Essence the only, well, not probably Essence the only team in the eight. I don't want to win it, but I can't see them going four weeks, particularly without um, you know that pre-finals by. So and, and it'll be interesting too if where they schedule finals and all that because of all the shit going on with COVID. Well, there's two games in Tassie and two games in Adelaide, so Christ knows where it ends up the following week. Yeah, it certainly won't be here. No, uh, I don't think we're allowed sport in Afghanistan. <laughs> no, you can't make those sort of jokes in Afghanistan, you know. You should go over there and feel what real tyranny is like. <laughs> Any final thoughts? Uh, final thoughts about the finals or just final thoughts? Just final thoughts about Collingwood and anger, anger and... No, uh, no, I'm just... Look, all I'm the really retrospective the geniuses and, and all, 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 yeah. all the obsessive... All the obsessives who are still going on about the same shit that, you know, if I could fucking let it go, I can't believe these other people can't. No, well, certain people in life just can't let stuff go and will flog that same opinion over and over and over again. So who knows with those types? But um, for me, um, I'm just glad the season's done. Um, I think a lot of my van- um, anger vanished once um, Buckle was moved on. I think that was a lot of the source of my angst. Um, it finally sort of shed the shackles that maybe now we can we can move forward in a new direction. Now at the end of the season, I don't feel any different. Um, I'm looking forward to seeing what we can we can do. I don't think we'll be anywhere near competitive or anything next year. I just want to see steps in the right direction. Uh, how do you sum up 10 the Bucks is 10 years at the Pies? That's what Jeff Brown told me. <laughs> um, I think on the whole, extremely disappointing. 
one um, year that ended in the the usual destination, um, but most of it was a downward trajectory. I think it was a waste of 10 years. Yeah, that's what it comes down for me, a waste of 10 years, and people will point that grand final. And the really argue, uh, persuasive people, I'll say, but if they won that grand final, it's like, well, we didn't. So that's where that conversation begins and ends. It was a fucking Well, at least we stopped Richmond from winning four in a row. Oh, fuck's sake. Um, fuck you, hell. <laughs> it's just, anyway, that's it from us. We'll actually be doing some specials in the off season, which begins now. Um, oh, good. What are we going to talk about? No, no. You wait and oh. see. And you want to hear, see some dead horses flogged? Well, Maybe we'll do it in a different way. Anyway, that's maybe. it from us. Not me. And that's it from us. That's it from us. Later. Catch. <laughs>